Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Saddleback webinar this week. I'm Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. We've got a great session for you today with uh, two return presenters who have partnered up to give us a great uh, conversation around collaboration. As you are signing in, please locate your control bar, which is at the bottom of your web browser window, and that is where you will find the chat, the Q&A, and the live transcript option. We do want you to chat with us today. So if you could, as you are signing in right now, please go to the chat, go ahead and select everyone from the drop-down menu, and then just type in where you're joining us from. And um, that way, when you participate in the webinar, that will ensure that your comment is going to everybody uh, as we go throughout the session today. If you forget to select everyone from the drop-down, only a couple of people from Saddleback here will see the comment and we want everybody to be able to share their thoughts with uh, all the attendees today. If you have questions, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A area and we will get to those at the end of the session. And if you would like to take advantage of subtitles, go ahead and click on live transcript and then uh, select show subtitles and those will pop right up. We'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time. Jody and Carly are here. And they are on Twitter too, and Saddleback's on Twitter. So if you could go to Twitter, follow us, say hello, let everyone know you are joining us for this great conversation today. And I'm sure many of you learned about this webinar from Carly and Jody on Twitter. So if you could go back to Twitter and let everybody know what you thought, that would be great. We would really appreciate that. So let's say hello to our presenters today. Hi, Carly. Hi, Jody. How are you? Doing well, Liz. I'm so excited. I love Saddleback webinars. <laughs> I love working with you, Liz. And I get to partner with the Jody Nolf. So I am like so fired up right now. <laughs> Me too. Thank this you. is like a this is like a, a power partnership here. Jody, how is life? How are you doing? We we are great down in, in Florida, and I am equally excited and I'm honored, quite honestly, and humbled that. I'm going to get to present with somebody who I just admire and respect so much. So I'm really excited to be with Carly today. And we are so happy that both of you um, decided to work together on this and uh, have returned to Saddleback for another webinar and actually talking about a really important topic that not everybody talks about because they assume that it doesn't need to be talked about. So, uh, and that of course is collaboration uh, amongst the teaching staff, right? Uh, push in, uh, co-teaching, how, how do we work together to ensure that our multilingual learners are getting what they need? So um, I just really appreciate you taking the time to work together and actually think about something that uh, our audience um, maybe hasn't received from a previous webinar. So that we're just really excited too about the content today. We'll get started in another minute. I just wanna head on, head on over to the chat to say hello. Uh, Angela, welcome, welcome to, let me scroll back up here. Lindsay, Rowena, nice to see you. Catherine, uh, Bryce, we've got North Carolina and Texas in the house. It's a lot of people from Texas, that's great. Hi, Robert. Robert's joining us again this week. Welcome back. Uh, um, Mr. and Mrs. I don't know how to say your name. Yoshebed Bailey in Maryland. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll have more people hopping in as we, uh, as we go through our session today. So hi, Karina. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, definitely feel free to chat and interact with us today uh, as Jody and Carly um, share their their great information around collaboration right there's there's a lot i'm sure there's a lot of questions about how to make collaboration happen um, as seamlessly as possible so with that let's go ahead and officially get started uh we go together i always get that song stuck in my head from greece every time i see that which i'm sure was was the point right <laughs> well it, it worked so we're talking about collaboration strategies for multilingual learners um especially um, uh, uh, Jody especially can speak to the secondary level on this. So um, again, we have Carly Spina joining us and Jody Nolf. If you don't know, uh, Carly is a multilingual education specialist and she is an author. Her book came out recently. It's called Moving Beyond for Multilingual Learners. And Jody Nolf is an ESOL coordinator at the school district of Palm Beach County. Both of them well-versed in this topic and uh, worked very hard and put together a, a 
great presentation for you. So uh, with that, it is time for you to take it from here. And um, I'll be back on at the at the end. So thanks again for joining us. All right, we are just so, so pleased. It's so fun always to, I love the Saddleback community. It's just a great group of educators and leaders. Um, so we are really excited to talk about this with you. Jody and I have both done a lot of collaboration on this topic. <laughs> um, so yes, we do want you to sing along, right? We go together. <laughs> so collaboration strategies for multilingual learners. Um, so you can find us on Twitter there. Jody and I, we love to have fun. Um, we are very passionate educators, both of us. Um, and so we included our, our headshots there because that's who we are as professionals, but we are also human beings, right? And we can't turn <laughs> off our fun side and all the, you know, the energy and the passion that we bring to our work every day. So we want to acknowledge that by including our fun selfies as well. <laughs> so we would love for you to follow us on Twitter if we're not already connected. And then please share out your thoughts, ideas, your questions, your resources, your expertise in this topic as well um, by using the hashtag Saddleback Webinar. I love Saddleback Webinars. Every time I watch one or participate in one, I will always just go through and I'll like type in that hashtag in the search bar at the top. So that way I can build my network and I can follow along with all the great work that's happening for our multilingual learners. Because if you're doing something great, I need to know about it so I can do it too. <laughs> um, so we hope that you can, um, you know, tweet your ideas and your resources and your thoughts on today's uh, learning. So we wanna start by going into the chat. So go ahead. Put in some of your thoughts and ideas. We wanted you to finish this sentence starter. We go together like. So in this chat right now, we want you to think of two things that go together. So you might think of like a famous pair, like Laverne and Shirley or Lucy and Ethel. Those might be your famous pair that pops into your mind. If you are a Disney fan like Jody and I, you might be thinking of like Mickey and Minnie or Chip and Dale. <laughs> or you could think of food items. I love food. I get, I'm easily motivated by food. So maybe you're thinking chips and salsa or salt and pepper. <laughs> but we would love to hear your pairing. What's on your mind? We go together like. Ooh, apple pie and ice cream. Oh, that sounds really good, especially if the apple pie is a little bit warm and the ice cream is nice and cold. Oh, that sounds so good. Donut and coffee, yes. Peanut butter and jelly. That's a like a very like well-known, right? Um, pairing. Ham and cheese, Batman and Robin. I love it. I love it. All right, so we're going to hop back in. You can keep thinking of your famous pair. Oh, yeah, cookies and milk. See, is anyone else hungry now? <laughs> I think I just made myself hungry. All these great ideas. Barbie and Ken. Yes, I love that one, Molly. Oh, Molly, I'm so glad you're here today. Coffee and a Danish. I love these. These are awesome. So while we're kind of thinking about things that go together, we wanted to set some intentions for our time together today. So um, here are our intentions. The first one is to understand that collaboration comes in many different forms and it manifests itself in various settings. So no matter what your district is doing, what your school is doing, uh, what your state is doing, all of those things. Uh, we're also gonna explore some ways to build and nurture our relationships with our collaborators. We're also going to integrate collaboration strategies across your partnerships and teams. And that can look um, very different from elementary to secondary. It can look very different across content areas. And we will explore how you can collaborate within your school setting to make it work for you and your team. And of course, the name of the game is student success. We're going to maximize student success through effective collaboration, because no matter where you're from, and I love how we're talking from all over the country and sometimes all over the world, I think it's safe to say that no matter who we are or where we're from, we all have the same goal in mind, and that is ensuring success for our students. And so we're going to look at that today. 
Absolutely. Ah, I'm so excited. So let's do a little bit of unpacking here. So this term collaboration, for some of us, it almost has become like a buzzword in our school districts. Like if you go to a meeting, like a staff meeting, or maybe like an all staff meeting where the whole district gets together and the word collaboration is up on the screen for, again, depending on your setting, it almost becomes a buzzword and people are like, oh, they're gonna talk about collaboration again. Or they're gonna say how important it is that we collaborate. Oh, like it's just like one of those education buzzwords. But in your setting, you might say, oh, collaboration, yes, because I need my teammates to get through this week. So when you hear the term collaboration, what does this mean for you in your setting, knowing that all of us have different settings, different cultures and climates of our schools and our districts? What does this mean to you in your setting? How do you collaborate with colleagues. So go ahead and think on that. Leave some ideas in the chat. And this might be something even as simple as like meetings. You could say that, right? Think of all the meetings that we go to. We go to so many meetings in education. Oh my goodness. Um, so we've got a great idea in the chat about uh, applying differentiated instruction. Yes, 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 absolutely. That's a positive. That's a really, um, I think, a popular uh, thing that a lot of folks are going to say. Having the time. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned the time. That's a really big one. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Time to meet and talk about the curriculum, about students, right? Our standards, all of those things. Planning, meetings. When I walk and talk, yes, like all of those hallway conversations, right? That's collaboration and action, absolutely creating district-wide presentations. So many of us, right, as, as multilingual educators, if you are an EL or bilingual or dual language, many times, like, you are the instructional leader, right, <laughs> for your department, um, for your students, for your colleagues. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of times where we're standing up in front of our colleagues and sharing information. Planning, yes. On Twitter, Patty, yes. I'm so glad you mentioned that because collaboration happens through Twitter and our social media feeds every single day. And a lot of people don't associate social media with collaboration, but it truly is. Like that's the that's some of the best PD I get. <laughs> I love that. Keep these ideas coming. I'm so glad that um, we're all kind of getting getting our groove here with this idea of collaboration. So we have this graphic on the screen here and many of the ideas that y'all mentioned are here in this graphic. So things like data meetings, right? Text messages with our teammates, like on the other side of the building, uh, those planning times, all of our emails that we send to each other uh, about our students and about the families that we serve or a student who's coming in next week or a student who needs to be screened or somebody have to give a makeup test to, right? Many of us are in the midst of access testing or other language proficiency assessments right now. Um, push in is also on there. Assessment is also on there. Report cards, but take a look at this one, laughing. Laughing, that's a piece of collaboration too. Post-it notes, right? How many times do we pop in and we leave a little post-it note for our teammate because we miss them, so we leave it on their desk or on their computer or somewhere that they're gonna see it. All of these different pieces are under that umbrella of collaboration. So collaboration, again, doesn't always mean co-teaching, right? Co-teaching is a really intensive um, like subset, right, of collaboration that, in that includes co-planning, co-instructing, co-assessing, co-reflecting, all of those things under that umbrella of, uh, of co-teaching. But if we think broadly of this idea of collaboration, we want to mention these three current realities. Number one is this, many of us serve as everybody's teammate. And oh my goodness, that's a lot. <laughs> that can weigh on us, especially if you are the only EL teacher or the only reading specialist, right? Depending on your role, depending on your setting, you it's really easy for us to feel like we are on an island, even though we're surrounded by teammates and colleagues all the time. But we are everybody's teammates because everybody has multilingual learners. Um, we also want to acknowledge this current reality here that Collaboration, again, it manifests itself in many different forms. If your district or your school is not doing a full um, thought or like a full rollout of co-teaching, for example, no, that's not, you know, that's not the only way to collaborate, right? 
Um, you might be delivering support through um, in-class support or out-of-class support, depending on your system. And then this big piece here, most of us at <laughs> schools, we don't have built-in time for collaboration. We truly don't. And when we do have school districts that do that, it's like very rare. It's like finding a pearl. <laughs> um, but we do have things like staff meetings. We do have things like student data meetings. We do have things like, you know, we're walking down the hallway together to, you know, go to the teacher's lounge or pick up our kids from recess, right? I'm thinking through my elementary lens here. Um, but those current realities are there. And so we wanna make sure that we uh, talk about that today. And then this is another, this is the fourth current reality. And this is kind of the purpose of what we wanted to make sure that we, we touched on today. Rarely do we receive professional learning opportunities specifically on collaboration. And it's so interesting, isn't it? If you were to think back to your undergrad courses or perhaps graduate courses, did you have any type of course in your teacher prep program that talked about collaboration that was like specifically just one course about collaboration with colleagues? No, I have yet to see a program that has a course dedicated to this. And it's just so interesting, right? We, we talk, we stand in front of kids all day and we talk about the importance of teaching them collaboration skills, right? We think it's so important, right? That's a life skill. Kids need to know, like as they're leave, leaving our 12th grade classrooms, right? Like our 12th grade advanced math or whatever, they leave us, they need to know how to collaborate no matter what pathway they choose. Um, so it's interesting because again, we, we talk about how important it is and it has become a buzzword in education. We teach about collaboration, but rarely do we receive that professional learning around collaboration. And even less so, do we have time truly to devote to this, building parity amongst collaborators. And that's just a kind of a fancy phrase for the, the thing that's on the bottom here, how we build our relationships with our colleagues. When we are the sole EL teacher or the sole reading specialist or whatever our role is, it is so important that we nurture the relationships with our colleagues, even the folks who might be oh, a little difficult to work with. <gasps> I said it. I said it, sometimes we do have colleagues and teammates who don't want to work with us, or we just, we're, we don't jive, right? Like we're not on the same page. Sometimes we'll say that phrase, um, but it's so important that for the folks that we do collaborate with, we spend time building up parity, how we pair together like chips and guac or salt and pepper or Lucy and Ethel. So let's talk about a few different ideas of ways that we can nurture that partnership. So the first thing is this idea, this language of us. Our language choices matter. This is something we all talk a lot about, right? When I say things like, oh, in my classroom, we do this, or in my classroom, I do this. I need to make sure that I'm being really mindful. If I have a teammate who pushes in, right, who has in-class support, I need to make sure that I am using wording that captures that both of us are there. Both of us are educators in this space. Um, so it's not my space, it's our space, right? It's not her classroom or his classroom, it's our classroom. Um, these are our students that we serve together. So the language of us is important. We also want to just touch on this piece here because how did we even enter this partnership? I was so excited a few years ago. I was able to launch a co-teaching program in my school district and we Ask people who is interested, find a partner that you really want to commit to this with, and they could sign up together. And it was really, really cool. But I have to say, it is super rare, right? That doesn't happen in most places. If you are um, pushing in or providing in-class support to a, you know, a team of teachers, very rarely do you get to say, I want to work with that teacher and that teacher and that teacher or that cluster of teachers. Many times I'm just assigned <laughs> a team of teachers or a group of teachers to work with and support. Um, so we wanna acknowledge that sometimes we are paired together because we are two willing partners that are ready to do great things together for kids. But other times 
it was assigned for us, right? Depending on clustering and depending on scheduling and all of these different things. Communication systems. For me, I love a quick text message. Uh, Jody and I have been talking about this as we have been collaborating on this project together. Um, for some of our teammates, a text message is so much better because we all have our phones in our pockets throughout the day, especially as language teachers, right? We always need to pull up a quick visual or translate something really fast or you know, share a sentence stem and we can kind of jot it down on our phone and hold it up to our student. So many, many of us have our cell phones near us or in our pockets while we're teaching, right? So sometimes it's easier for me to like, you know, again, during the school day, things come up, right? Schedules change, somebody just threw up and now I have to make sure that I support the student and getting down to the office, all of those different things, right? Or, oh no, I forgot we have an assembly <laughs> at eighth period. We were planning on, you know, launching this unit today. I need to text my teammate to let her know, oh my gosh, we forgot, we're gonna have to move this. So a text message might be better for you and your partners or emails. Emails might be better. So find out that communication system that's going to work for you and your partnership. Um, and if you have two differing types of communication systems, you're going to have to talk about ways to make sure that you're honoring each other's communication preferences. Maintaining trust is a really big one. When we open up our classroom to another adult, sometimes that's intimidating because we feel very vulnerable. What we do, we pour so much passion and energy into, right? When we have our students in front of us, we are on fire, right? We're doing so many different things. We're excited about what we're teaching. We've got a million decisions that we make every minute. <laughs> no wonder we're so tired. Um, but when we open up our space, that is opening ourselves up to those moments of vulnerability, right? Our days are hard. Our days now are even harder than they've, they've ever been. Um, and when we have those days where we feel escalated or stressed out or we're not acting our, in our best way, we have our teammates right there watching us you know, kind of come undone. So we need to make sure that we provide and maintain those like that, that structure of, of trust and support um, because we all have bad days and we all need to kind of lift each other up in that work. I would never go to the teacher's lounge and say, wow, you should have seen Carly lost it today because, you know, she just, she just totally came undone over there. So I need to be really, really mindful of how I am helping my partner and build up and maintain that trust. Speed dating is so important, especially if you were kind of assigned a partnership to work with, right? Um, getting to know your partner, like what are their favorite, what's their favorite way to take their coffee? Um, what, what is something that drives them crazy? Um, what it, what's their favorite style of music? Um, how do they feel about all these spirit days coming up, right? Getting to know our partner as human beings, not only as teachers, but as human beings, that's important. We need to know who we're with, right? That always builds up the relationship. We often talk about that in terms of the student lens, like how well do we know our students and that builds better connections and we have a better community right, in that way, right? It's the same with our, with our partners, our colleagues, our teammates. Celebrations. When we know that our partner has accomplished a milestone or they're celebrating something personal over the weekend, I want to make sure that I, like my teammate knows, I am cheering them on. I am like putting them out there on social media like, oh my goodness, Jody just did this. I'm so excited. Or um, if, if they're celebrating something or they're a little bit nervous about something, um, I might keep just blank stationery in my desk drawer. That way I'm always ready to write a quick note or a quick note of encouragement on the bad days where we come undone. <laughs> um, but celebrating alongside your partner is really important. Healthy boundaries. This is something that keeps popping up. And I think we, we gave it a lot more attention during like when the pandemic first started. Having healthy boundaries. That's so important for a relationship, right? Anytime we are collaborating for our students, right? We always wanna keep our students in mind. And many times we're like, go, go, go go hard, right? Go hard, go big for kids, all of those things. But we also need to know we have limits. We have those moments where we just need to pause and rest and just be and just exist and give ourselves grace, right? And so if I have that communication system with my teammate and I say, oh, text message, that's the best way 
you know, to reach me all the time. Like if you call me, I'm not going to answer my phone, but if you text me, I will respond to you, but establish that boundary. Don't text me before 6.30 a.m. And do not text me after 4.30. That we need to establish together. Um, recognizing ruts. Like we get into sometimes as just, again, not only as teachers, but just as human beings, sometimes we get into ruts. And right now it's February. February is a really hard time of year for educators, but also people in general, because it's winter time and it's always gray. I'm looking at right now the Chicago land area. It's like just gray skies. I am so desperate to see a blue sky and some sunshine and feel some warmer temperature on my skin. Um, so it's really easy for us to kind of fall into ruts, not only with, again, myself as a human, but in my practice, in my teaching, and in my partnership. Sometimes I'll just like, we'll kind of default onto the same like co-instructing model of like one teach, one support, and we'll just, we'll just do that but we got to recognize when we are falling into those ruts. What can we do to kind of spice things up? What novelty can we introduce here? And then that date night mentality, right? We want to make sure that we're devoting time to just have fun, <laughs> just be human beings together. Can we go bowling after school? Maybe we don't have all the time in the world to do those things, but like, what if we said for our next team meeting, if we're so lucky to have one, Maybe we're just going to watch an episode of a Netflix show together on our computer and let's have that date night once a month, once a week, whatever we can do, or a date night, five minutes. <laughs> let's watch this music video or let's watch this viral TikTok video that everyone's talking about. Let's just have some fun together and be real for a little bit. Um, so on these, you know, as we kind of start digging into, okay, so now I've got this partner. Maybe I decided to work with them. Maybe I was assigned to work with them. We always talk about co-planning, right? That time where we can sit down together and you know plan for instruction. But in reality, we don't have time built into our schedule to do these things. So how can we maximize our opportunities to co-plan? So if you are able to have a sit down time, whether it's five minutes a day, 30 minutes a week, five minutes a week, um, maybe having an agenda or a consistent template or structure to your planning. And Jody's going to give us some really great examples of this in a little bit. You might also identify what are those pre-planning things that we have to do so that when we're sitting side by side and we only have seven minutes, how can we really make sure those seven minutes are so efficient? Uh, allowing space for that social conversation. So again, when we want, we get finally together, the kids are not in the room, right? We don't have parents popping in and out or other teammates of ours popping in and out. Maybe we set a timer for our seven minutes of planning and two minutes of those is just gonna be like social conversation. How did it go the other night? I know you were nervous to meet your boyfriend's parents. How did that go? Like give yourself that space and have that be a norm. Uh, identifying again that weekly time. You might have in-person planning time, but you also might say, you know what? That doesn't work for us. So on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., we're gonna hop on a Zoom for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, and we're going to co-plan together at that time. Or, <laughs> again, we're going to be emailing on Tuesday. That's our heavy day for instructional planning for the week. Think about what's going to work best for your schedule. And then you also want to identify this, because as we were talking in the chat, you guys were all throwing in great ideas of ways that we're collaborating, just always, right? Like, it's hard not to. <laughs> but those emails, those hallway conversations, those moments where I'm like, running like I gotta I'm late to you know make sure I get to the staff meeting but I need to pop my head in real quick and remind my teammate of this and we, remember we're going to change this and we're going to talk about this first and we're going to flip the lesson and do this instead so all of those non-structured co-planning times exist and they're a part of our collaboration but during that structured co-planning time if we have it what does that look like and then when we're co-instructing when we're sharing that space in front of the kids, we need to do, we need to have a few norms established for our partnership so that we can be our best selves for the kids. So identify your non-negotiables. So this is something kind of, you know, if you've ever had a roommate or if you have a significant other, right? You know how easy it is and quick 
it happens to step on each other's toes. Like, oh my goodness, it drives me crazy when she leaves the dishes in the sink. Or, oh my goodness, remember like how we all play like garbage Tetris <laughs> and no one's taking out the garbage. It's like, oh, can you please do that? It's always me doing it. So identify your non-negotiables. What are those things that drive you nuts and put them on the table? So like, if I'm in the middle of a mini lesson, I'm going to say to my teammate, like, please interject at any time. Please interject to repeat, to clarify, to whatever. I'm good with that. Please do that. But a teammate of mine might say, no, 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 no. Don't interject until like we hit the, the six minute mark of the mini lesson. Then please interject. Or during the think, pair, share part, then I want you to hop in. So identify what works best for you and your personality and your teaching style. And then share those non-negotiables. It's not enough just to recognize them. We got to tell our teammates like, hey, there's, I don't, I don't like gum in my class. Like that's like a non-negotiable for me. Kids can't chew gum in here. Share that. And then we have to acknowledge we are going to misstep. We are absolutely going to misstep. It's going to happen. Um, so what's going to like unfold when we acknowledge that? We have to identify how to address those moments where we do misstep. Are you going to have a code word or a signal? So for some partnerships, if you've been working with the same person for a long time, you might feel super comfortable and say like, oh, no, no. Like if she if she missed up in my, in the, you know, in our space, I'm just going to tell her like, hey, you did that thing. Hey, we talked about that. No, 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 don't do that. But if you are a non-confrontational person, like and, and that kind of intimidates you, like, oh my gosh, how am I going to bring this up? I don't want them to be mad at me. I, you know, I, I really want to make sure I'm, I'm being good to my partner. Maybe you establish a code word. And this is something that I did with the partnerships that I worked with. Our code word was waffles. And so if I violated my teammates non-negotiable, she's going to be like, Mrs. Spino, waffles. And then I go, oh, waffles. And then we kind of laugh about it. And like, it's funny, right? The kids have no idea what we're talking about. They think we like waffles. But then because she waffled me, I have to bring it up later. Like, oh my goodness, you waffled me. I'm so, so sorry. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that I do this and this because I don't want to violate your non-negotiable again. Thank you for calling me out. Thank you for waffling me. <laughs> so think about ways to address it because if we don't address those small things, it's going to build up right? Like that garbage Tetris, it's going to build up. And then we want to create space for that cold reflection. S like schedule that time and say, okay, how are we doing together? How are we doing together? Is it making a difference for kids that we're both here? Of course it is. How are we doing individually in our space? More importantly, how are our students doing? What are we noticing? How is this student growing? Is this student really struggling with something? Because again, when we have those two sets of eyes in a space, oh, that's the best. We can catch so much more. Um, then we need to kind of reflect on our practice. Are we falling into any unhealthy routines? What routines of ours are working? What's going really well? How much time do we allot each week or each month for that co-reflection piece. So allowing space for co-reflection to happen is so important. Thank you, Carly. So now what um, we're going to do in this presentation is we're going to actually show you some things that can help make collaboration with your teammate work effectively, efficiently. So now I'm going to share my screen just be a moment. We'll get this going. And we are ready to rock. So if any of you have ever visited um, my Saddleback webinars before, you know that I have created a planning template. And as Carly had mentioned, this can really be a time saver. Okay. This can help with your planning time with your teammate, because let's face it, nobody has time. I mean, that. let's just be real here. Nobody has time. So if you look on the um, left-hand side, you will see that the content teacher deals with the standards, okay? What materials I need, the skills of the lesson. This also goes hand in hand with, with what Carly was talking about regarding saving time by having some standards and ideas beforehand. What are we gonna talk about? We have five minutes. Okay, we have five minutes today because that faculty meeting ran late 
Then we had to talk with that student. So that 20 minute conversation that we meant to have third period, now we're down to five. Okay, you know what? We need to talk about key vocabulary. And you know what? We're gonna scratch the assessment part because that's not for another couple of weeks, but we really need to touch on that vocab. So that's gonna be our five minute time and we could get to the other parts later. So the content teacher is going to deal with the differentiation, whereas the ESL support will deal with the language development. And the way this all kind of came about, at least in my setting, I am a school-based coordinator, so I am in and out of classrooms and I'm meeting with content area teachers and my team of ESL support teachers regularly. It's who does what? Is that her job or am I supposed to be doing that? Because if she's supposed to do it, but I thought I was supposed to do it, then we're doing double work or it's not getting done at all because, well, I thought she was covering that. Oh, but that's language. But so this is how you can divide your roles, define your roles and support one another at the same time. So let's look at the content area science teacher. This is seventh grade. And what I want you to notice, if you've seen this before, if you haven't seen this before, notice that all of the um, skills, materials, the standards, the objectives, they all deal with content. If you look in the middle, students have already been assessed on how to properly record data. That is a content standard for seventh grade. If we look to the right, we're looking at how we're going to assess this student through a multiple choice assessment. But I want you to also pay attention to the bottom part for the accommodations. Notice that the content area teacher is still responsible for adapting those lessons. And you're saying, wait a minute, but that's language you just said. I'm going to show you the difference, okay? So let's look at the ESL support teachers adaptations. Notice all of the yellow. Notice that before the content area teachers side of the template handled the content. The ESL support teacher is not supposed to be a content area teacher. I'm not saying that they're not responsible at all. I'm saying that in my setting, okay, my ESL support teachers, they often go to multiple content areas. Come on, we secondaries, we know. Your ESL teacher is running around to math, science, language arts, social studies, world history, civics, yada, 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 and the list goes on and on. They cannot know all of that content, but they can know how to modify and adapt and scaffold the language. So all of these skills and strategies deal with how we're going to make that language supplied by the content area teacher, accessible for our multilingual learners through circling and cognates and frames and stems and all of those things that we are already experts in, but we can bring the language to life. We can bring the content to life that the content area teacher has already set forth. How? Through the standards. So note that all are strategies related to language development. So let's look at some more key strategies and scaffolds. So the content area teacher will choose the concepts. It's the what I'm going to teach, whereas the ESL support will reinforce the concepts. So we use, for example, strategies, smart boards, word walls, cognates, key vocabulary, et cetera. So this is an actual seventh grade science classroom. And here is a smart board activity that I constructed, but I did not choose the vocabulary myself. And that was what is so important to understand. I did not, as the ESL support say, well, I'm going to make sure that they understand color and inferencing, that's content. That is according to the strands, through the benchmarks, the objectives. So once I know that, then I can say, how am I going to make it come to life for those learners? So the content area teacher and the ESL support can co-create. Now, I do want to say that in my school, 
we are a um, collaborative model. We are not a co-teaching model. And that is an important difference because what that means is that our collaborative support staff are not teachers of record. They plan, but they plan according to language standards. They are not co-grading. They are not co-planning content lessons. So I just wanna clarify that it might look differently in your setting, but in my secondary school, it is a collaborative push-in model. We completely believe in push-in, not pull-out for inclusiveness. And so that collaborative teacher is going into that content area teacher's classroom, which is a whole other um, new dynamic for many secondary schools that I'll talk about in just a moment that Carly did touch on. So the ESL support can scaffold based upon the proficiency levels. So here we have some strategies. We have, for example, infographics and sentence frames and stems. You know that I always say those are my faves. So here we go with our infographic. The content area teacher can construct this. Okay. And the reason I'm saying that is because I have had some content teachers say to me, am, am I supposed to do that? Is she supposed to do that? I, I don't, I don't know who does what. So because this is content related, you can actually co-plan this together. You can co-create it. Whereas the content area teacher can choose the words, quantitative, qualitative, observing, and the definitions. This is the definition that our textbook uses. This is the definition that we see on our, um, on our benchmark assessments. So this is how I would like for them to understand it. I want them to understand this particular connotation because that is how they're going to be assessed. And then on the right-hand side, the ESL support can say, you know what? They can draw a picture here. Um, they can do a graphic here and because we have, of course, we have multiple levels in our, in our classes. We know that we have our beginners, we have our emerging, we have bridging. That's where the ESL support teacher can really come in handy and say, okay, now that you have this infographic, uh, we have beginners. So we're going to have a lot more blocks filled in. But because we have an intermediate speaker over here, I'm going to pull these and have that intermediate speaker complete the infographic himself because I know his level of proficiency. And so that's where the scaffolding takes place on the part of the ESL support. And so this has really helped a lot of my teachers understand, now I get it. Now I understand where that collaborative ESL support teacher's place is in my classroom through scaffolding the language, but not the content. Because remember, we never really scaffold content, right? Because they all learn the same we scaffold the delivery. So some of you have seen this, but if you have not, you're in for a treat. This is an actual seventh grade science teacher. And what I want you to pay attention to as we watch this is pay attention to the language that each of us is using and what um, skills each of us is focusing on. We have the content teacher on the right, and we have the ESL support on the left. What are some of the key vocabulary words that you need me teaching that day? Um, for sure, observation and inference. Okay. And the qualitative again and quantitative. So okay. those four words are big, are really what this activity is focusing on. Okay. I found that the difference between observation and inference is hard for them. Gotcha. So we need to make sure that we kind of get that going for them so okay. they're able to do this. Okay, so what I'm thinking is because quality and quantity, um, they already kind of know those stems from the underlining. Yep. I'm going to really reinforce the difference mm -hmm. and I'm going to use cognates that at least I know. For example, I know that quanto mm -hmm. means how much, so mm -hmm. that refers to quantity. Um, so I'm going to use whatever I can cognate wise. I'm also going to um, determine understanding through a lot of pictures because yes. I feel like I can't really rely on any the native words. language that yes. I know and because for my students who might not be Spanish speakers who don't know that. Right. So I'm going to use pictures and what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to have them maybe like if I have a picture of maybe five bananas, mm -hmm. I'll have them count for quantity, right, for quantity, but then I'm going to have them describe, describe it for the quality, for the quality and they yeah. could do that through pictures. Perfect. 
I'm going to um, ask them based upon what they see, what they might think, and that, that, can yeah. might be, that could reinforce the, difference the inference. The, yep, the inference and the observation. So, for example, if we have like a green banana and a yellow banana mm -hmm. and a brown one, mm -hmm. based upon what they observe, what, what can, can they say infer about, it? Right. about maybe which one is the most ripe, right. which one which isn't ripe yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I want to kind of do inference that way Perfect. through pictures. Mm -hmm. So what I hope you What are some of the key vocabulary? is that as the ESL support, I wasn't choosing the vocabulary. The content area teacher already had that and it was already able to communicate that to me as this is what's important. Now, some of you might be thinking to yourselves, yeah, we don't have time to meet like that. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. We don't either. Come on, nobody has time. But I could do this in a Google Meet. As Carly said, we could use our phones. Let me tell you, my phone has been golden lately because it's, oh, I ran out of copies. You're at the copier all the way across campus. Run me another 20, okay? I mean, that phones are golden. I mean, what would we do without them? However, I understand that time is precious and we don't have that, but that little planning episode was a couple of minutes. So if you think I never have time for this, I'm never gonna have time for this. You can catch those two minutes on the fly. And I'm going to tell you also, you're already collaborating. I can guarantee that most of you, if not all of you, collaborate in some way. You just might not realize, realize that you're collaborating. This is just kind of structuring it to make it more efficient for you. So here we'll look at some more key strategies and scaffolds. The content area teacher modifies the assessments and the ESL support assists with the understanding. So here's the strategy of adapting assessments. We eliminate the choices. We offer alternatives for responding, such as drawing and acting out. We provide word banks, sentence uh, frames, and stems. This is a very common um, misunderstanding among my teachers. It's nothing wrong. It's just, well, I thought that maybe she would be modifying the test. I gave her the test yesterday. As the content area teacher, I suggest that you do it. I'm not saying that, well, that's your responsibility. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying by you making the adaptations yourself, you can tailor it to what you want the students to know. Because if you have the ESL support teacher do that, first of all, you have to get them a key. They have to understand a lot more of content. And this is where the planning might fall apart because you now you need the time to talk about the answers and which one you're going to take away. And what, if you just modify it, you can save time by reserving that precious discussion minute and a half to hear my two choices, make sure they understand conclusion, make sure they understand experiment and boom, there you go. Make sure that they understand inference. Remember, we went over that, review that with them. And so there's your conversation, not G, are we going to take away D? Are we going to take away C? That can be pre-done by the content area teacher. And then the ESL support will assist with that understanding of the vocabulary. Sometimes the ESL support teacher, depending upon the level of student, might need to um, explain and demonstrate just what the student is supposed to do. We do a lot of assessments on computer now, and our newcomers need help with navigating the computer system. And that is what our ESL support teachers can also do. So here we have the um, content area teacher modeling the strategies, and then the ESL support teacher can reinforce in small groups. So we have the model circling, underlining, and reviewing. I love the I do, we do, you do. I'm not gonna lie. When I was a content area teacher, I'm a secondary language arts and reading teacher. For those of you who don't know, I love the I do, we do, you do. It's such a gradual release that the ESL support can pull in that small group, pull to a horseshoe table or maybe just a small cluster of guests. In my school, as I mentioned, we push in. So once the um, content area teacher has modeled and now is circulating among the students, seeing the we do and the you do, the ESL support now is the time to work in that small group, reinforcing those concepts that the content area teacher has led in the whole group. 
So here we have a content area teacher creating the lesson. And then the ESL support reinforces those concepts for deeper understanding. And that could be done through paper journals. It could be done through digital interactive notebooks. I have both because um, last year when we were far more virtual, our teachers used a lot more of the digital interactive. But I will say my science teachers, especially, especially my sixth grade, they really love those composition notebooks and the spirals. So where does each role take place? The content area teacher is going to decide what goes in that journal. The ESL support is going to say, okay, take out your journals because now we're going to reinforce inferencing, observation, and we're going to look at those bananas and we're going to think and infer which one is the most right. And class, we're going to maybe draw those in our journals or take a little graphic to put in the interactive notebook as a reminder that this is what inference is. So your newcomers can participate, your emerging bilinguals, emerging multilinguals, everyone can participate in this activity. So we have some key sentence frame examples. The content area teacher and the ESL support teacher can co-create this, whereas the content area teacher supplies the content and the ESL support can scaffold. So for our bridging and reaching, we are learning about variables. We're learning about independent and dependent and control variables. The content area teacher has chosen that content based upon the benchmarks and standards. And hey, this is chapter seven. We're gonna have an assessment next week and I want everyone involved. So how are we gonna make that happen? The ESL support teacher can scaffold. So here are some frames that both teachers, my advice, I would have both teachers create this together, maybe in a Google doc. Why together? So that the ESL support teacher can know for 100% certain that this is the content this is the important part of the content, and this is how the student needs to understand it. So we have the two types of variables, independent and dependent, although both types of variables change. The independent variable is changed, but the dependent is measured. And here we have it for developing and expanding. Remember, we do not change the content. All students need to learn the same benchmarks. We change the delivery. And I've always said that they can learn it. They just need to learn a different method of delivery and learn those strategies, how through scaffolds. So we have some example frames for developing. The light color is an independent variable because it changes. The plant height is a de dependent variable because it's measured. It is simplified, but not simple. And so here we have it for our entering and merging. There we have that same graphic. They are learning the same content. So we have some example frames for emerging. Notice that here, because we have entering students, we have a word bank. I would suggest again, that that is supplied by the content area teacher so that vocabulary is um, enforced. The correct vocabulary is taught and then the ESL support support teacher can work from there. Sometimes though, and I wanna make this very clear, um, Carly and I were actually having this conversation. We said, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be your best friend. Um, my daughter is actually going, my older one is going off to college for the first time. I'm gonna be one of those um, new college parents. So I said to her, I said, you know, your roommate doesn't have to be your best friend. It needs to be somebody that you can share space with. And it's the same idea here. It needs to be somebody that you can share space with. And Carly and I also discussed, it's, it's very similar to a marriage. It's, this is not gonna be 50-50 all the time. It's just not. There might be times, especially if you um, don't really know your um, co-teacher, your collaborative teacher, where you say, gosh, I feel like I'm doing everything this week. And that, that might happen. But that doesn't mean that you stop supporting one another. And that's where all of Carly's great strategies come in, where you reflect and you say, you know what? I, I felt like I needed a little bit more um, of support this week. And that's where you have the conversation. Hey, you know what? You're right. I got caught up in another content area, but next week is gonna be different because I'm gonna catch those kids up, give them a little extra love and give your class the attention that it needs because I'm just being a realist here. 
we float around a lot to multiple content areas. We do not have the luxury, at least in my school, of one-to-one, -one, one content, one class all the time. It just doesn't work that way for us because we don't have that kind of staff. So we have to be practical. And that's where those conversations are so important. Joey, so, I'm, yeah. I'm just gonna say, I just appreciate so much all of the different strategies that you show. And I appreciate, because I think when we think about like roles and responsibilities, it's like, who's gonna do what by when, right? And like thinking in terms of that, like if I know exactly what to expect of my partner, that helps me understand what I need to contribute. So having that clearly defined and maybe co-constructing that, you know, those ideas, I think that's just so helpful. I, I completely agree. And that's why I made the planning template in the first place. While it looks very labor intensive, I've always said, make it work for you. You might have two minutes where you say, oh, we don't have time to work on that sheet, but we're going to fill in the vocabulary for the week because tomorrow I'm going to be out so you'll have the planning template. So you'll already know that this is the vocabulary they're learning tomorrow, because let's face it, we're absent. We are called into meetings. We are, <laughs> we are under COVID protocols. I mean, it happens where I'm going to be out for the next two days, but here's what's going on. So if you could really work on inference because they just don't have it yet, it's a communication tool. And by sharing these um, responsibilities, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, both teachers share the joy of watching their students grow in content area knowledge and language proficiency because really we're sharing the joy. We're not sharing the job. We're not sharing the onus. We're not sharing the, the burden. We're sharing the joy of watching our students grow in language and in content area knowledge, which is exciting. I mean, I th you know, that is what we all want. And we always say, right, two heads are better than one. If we Absolutely. can have multiple adults caring about kids, how lucky are we? That's that's the that's the greatest. Um, and I also love, like, anytime we're talking about collaborative structures in our schools, it's so beautiful because, again, like, I might be really highly skilled in this one thing, but I really fall short in this other thing. And maybe my teammate, that's her passion or that's, his skill set, and we can both bring our passions, our gifts, our interests, our professional interests into our space that we share together. So all of us can come to the table feeling like we're contributing. Um, and that's really key. And that's a good way to nurture that relationship and that partnership too. Um, and I think it's I really say, important that you oh, mentioned the strengths. I'm sorry, but oh. you know, we, we, we kept touching on, you know, what we're good at and sharing and, you know, that is where the 60-40 comes in, the 50-50, sometimes it's the 70-30, 80-20, just like a friendship, a marriage. It is any relationship where you say, wow, you're so good at that. Could you please just run with that this week? Because that's not my strong suit. And really what I want to do is I want to sit back and watch you so I can learn from you. And that's what's another great thing about these relationships. It's, it's your, it's your in-house PD. <laughs> yes, it truly is. Anytime we have that, like that moment where we're co-planning or we're co-instructing or we're co-assessing or co-reflecting or any of those moments where we're collaborating, even emails, like that is job embedded professional learning. <laughs> and there are so much that I learned from my partners as I, uh, you know, as we collaborate. Um, I always pull a lot from, from what they do. Um, we wanted to share a few different resources and they are linked in the, um, in the link that uh, Liz had dropped in a few times. Um, but these are two different resources or a few different resources that we wanted to share. So this is the latest uh, by Andrea Honigsfeld and Maria G. Dove. Um, this is a book specifically on co-planning, just that one piece of the global picture of collaboration. So that's a really great book. We definitely recommend it. Um, this is uh, the black book here is their second edition of um, collaborating for English learners. So as Andrea and Andrea and Maria, they are really big into co-teaching. So if your district or your school is starting to explore co-teaching, remember that is one specific model of collaboration. 
they have really, really powerful content in their books. Um, we also linked a great article for maximizing co-planning time. Um, so you can check that out. And then there's a lot of folks to follow on Twitter, but we definitely recommend you follow Andrea. And then our friends at Ready, Set, Co-Teach, they're always posting a lot of really great content. And again, social media, right? That's a great way for us to learn and collaborate online with each other and lift up and elevate our skills as practitioners. We can go Next ahead slide. and go. Yeah. And um, so we do know there are a few questions that we want to make sure that we, we answer today, but um, there is our contact information. So if you, you know, those moments where you're like in inside of a webinar or you're in a professional learning session, and then like later on, two hours later, you're like, oh, I should have asked this. <laughs> that happens to me all the time. I'm like mm -hmm. a shower person, like my shower ideas. I'm like, wait a minute, why didn't I ask this? Or I should have mentioned this scenario. Um, Three in the morning up. for me. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So you can hit us up online, uh, use our emails or Twitter. Um, we're happy to, to chat and continue uh, these conversations and, and these ideas with you. But I did see, Liz, do we, is it okay if we have time for? Oh, definitely. I actually turned my camera on probably a little bit too early uh, because I was looking in the chat and there were some questions and comments in there. And I was like, oh, we've got to get to these and I was going to try to interject but I wasn't oh definitely um, I have yeah. not been looking at the chat do you want to take over the screen um yeah I can do that let's sure, uh okay. let's do that okay and we'll let everybody know what's coming up next week and then we'll get right into the questions so next week we have another episode of coffee with Katie and Richard uh they are joining us to talk about critical thinking and how that works as a foundation to literacy development. So, you know, Katie and Richard, they join us every six weeks or so, every four to six weeks, and we love having them on. So they're coming up next week. Uh, make sure you register at our website or when you get the email prompting you to register, please sign up so you don't miss any great content uh, from Katie and Richard. Uh, if you missed our webinar last week, our new Go SEL Tween Literacy Library is now available. Uh, excellent resource, high low, targeted to tweens, so grades four through eight, and really hits those social emotional learning skills and emotion vocabulary, which is so critical um, to being able to identify, describe, uh, and understand emotions to be able to regulate and then um, interact with others. So this is a great resource for that. Um, and then finally, here are the questions. So Jody, as you were um, going through your strategies and giving your examples, hold on, mm -hmm. I wanna open up my chat here so I don't miss any, um, so I don't miss any um, comments. So the, co the next week's webinar is on the 24th, the 24th, so one week from today. Um, okay, let me focus. So something that came up in the chat while you were talking about the planning and the scaffolding for language. You covered mm -hmm. sort of content area vocabulary and you covered um, assessment. And the question that came in was, where do the where does the scaffolding for the formative check fit into that? Do are we scaffolding exit tickets? Are we uh, is there is there a specific thing that we are doing to make sure um, that the student is picking up on the lesson objectives? Um, in the moment and is there any scaffolding that needs to occur for that sometimes there will be and and where does planning for that fit into your process and i thought it was a, a an interesting point yeah i mean absolutely i mean let me i just want to make sure that i'm understanding the question correctly about um you know as regarding assessment and demonstrating understanding and determining understanding am i correct with that that's correct okay so i think that that is where the real relationship and the partnership really can blossom because you you can set according to the language template um, and especially for a lot of multilingual learners, they have language objectives. So I wouldn't say personally, well, as the content area teacher, I'm only gonna look at the content objectives. And as the language support teacher, I'm only gonna look at the language support objectives. I think that together you discuss those together and say, okay, how are we going to determine that the student has understood the language, meaning the language objectives? Do, for example, using the example from the lesson, how are we going to make sure that the child really understands inference because we know that they've been struggling with that? The content area teacher, 
how are we going to understand that the student understood that you infer a piece of data when you don't have all of the evidence yet and you're trying to draw conclusions. So that's a little bit more content-based. The language is understanding that concept of inference as a vocabulary word. And then the content area teacher determines the understanding of the real world application of that concept of inference. And then you have the discussion. Okay, I think they got the language objective. Like they really seem to understand, but they still got it wrong on the test. So maybe we need to work a little bit more on scaffolding the content because we already know that they've met the language objective. They've, mm -hmm. They understood all the vocabulary that they needed this week, but they're not really understanding its application in terms of applying it to a content area objective. So what I, so to kind of sum up, I would look at it that way where each player will look at their key pieces, but not in isolation. You're going to assess based on the language objective and the content and then have that conversation together to say, how can we bring that student up in, in, in both types of um, scenarios, not just understanding mm -hmm. what the word means in relation to observation versus inference, but understanding how to apply it in a content area um, situation or a content area assessment, because we do those benchmark assessments in, in districts. Yeah, and, and for sure, like you said, when you opened up uh, your answer to this question, that, that really goes back to um, having that routine, that relationship, that understanding with the content area teacher and setting those expectations um, uh, from who, you know, who is really paying attention to what, and then you come together to formulate next steps. So thank you for that. Um, then somebody was asking about the specific co-planning template. Do you have one? Yes, you do. Um, and that is uh, in the slide, in the slides, correct? And we can also send people to your, is it, it's, I'm sure it's on your website, right too, Jenny? Yes, I'm so happy to share it. Just the fact that people have asked for it. Some people, they say, well, you know, there's so much, we would never have time to do all that. I never created it as, okay, this is your assignment. You're going to sit down for an hour. Come on, nobody has an hour. But this could be something that is organic and fluid. I know those terms are a little buzzy, but <laughs> I, I mean it is, you know what? We're just going to work on the vocabulary because we only have two minutes. That meeting ran so long. And tomorrow we don't have time at all because we have a PLC and then I got a conference and then I got to call a parent. So my planning period is done. I have no time. But in a couple of days, we're going to talk about the language objective in terms of the formal assessment that they have next week, you could do a piece at a time. And that's a whole unit and think a whole unit might take a good couple of weeks. You could do five minutes here, five minutes there, and then it's done. And then you take it with you and modify it as necessary. That's great. I, and the whole Google doc idea. So you have the template, you, you can put that template onto a shared doc, like you said, and then just add to it as you go. And um, if you're not able to carve out that time to sit together for five or 10 minutes, then you can always go back to it and then text each other, follow up, that sort of thing. So it's, these have been really great concrete ideas. Um, I think I got everything that was in the chat, a lot of thank yous and a lot of, this is just what I needed. And um, people are very excited. Um, yeah. And Patty points out that Andrea Honingsfeld and Maria Dove are very active and um, accessible on Twitter and they love to respond. So um, we, we really appreciate that. We've had Dr. Honingsfeld on our webinar series. She's fantastic. And we highly recommend that you check her out. And if you have any, um, follow her and check out her books. She's always got great um, information. Okay, one question that was in the Q&A. Um, Robert had asked about um, multilingual learners who have IEPs. Now, this is a, a this is a whole different like um, collaborator who then gets into this circle, right? So now we've got to extend that collaboration out potentially to a third person if our learner has an IEP as well. But I would imagine that a lot of the same uh, principles that you've laid out here would also apply to um, a special education um, collaborative teacher. So um, that is, and, and we do actually have two or three webinars specifically around this topic of multilingual learners, English learners, newcomers in terms of special education and, uh, and how all that 
works. And that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge topic. Um, so you can check those out on our YouTube channel, but um, can either of you speak to like personal experiences on that? Yes. So I have served for many years. I had many students who were duly identified um, with, you know, being a multilingual learner who also has an IEP. Um, and it's so important that we, you know, there's often this like, old saying of like one type of service trumps another, but no, our students, their civil rights, right? They guarantee access to both. Um, and so not, there is not one that trumps the other in any way, shape or form ever. Um, and if that's a practice in your school, then you need to, you know, make sure that you are equipped, grab that dear colleague letter, um, grab that legislation and bring it forward to your administrators because we cannot violate our student civil rights. Um, but I'll, I'll just touch briefly on the collaboration piece, even when it comes to writing the IEP itself. The EL teacher, the multilingual educator must be present and we can co-construct that IEP. There are a lot of really great resources out there. There is one book that is specifically about <laughs> IEPs for English learners. I think it's called IEPs for ELs. Um, but this is a, a resource that will break down all of the pieces of the IEP and what types of contributions the EL teacher should be mentioning at each stage of the game, right? It shouldn't be the first time that we're all coming together to have a conversation about our student at the IEP meeting or at the reavail meeting or at the you know start of the school year. We should have ongoing communication about our students because we need to make sure that we are following the student's IEP, not only giving them that language access, but also access to support their, their specific need, whatever their um, IEP has identified as their specific need. Um, so again, sometimes it's just one other collaborator, but many times it's more of a team. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was gonna just gonna say some of my favorite meetings, if I could say that, are sitting in IEP meetings because then I feel like I could really provide a voice for the language needs. Not that, you know, not that I wanna dismiss the other needs, but, in the IEP, there is a language objective. There is a language component in an IEP. And we, as the ESL support team, I, I love having those conversations because I have to tell you, we have gotten so creative. When you have a really, really good ESE team and your in, in my district, we call it ESE, Exceptional Student Education. And so we work together. And let me tell you, we've gotten so creative with schedules that really, really work for the kids. We have classes that address their language needs and classes that address their other needs and they have a beautiful schedule. I mean, it's amazing what you can do when you really work as a great team. Mm -hmm. I like those meetings a lot. Yeah. Yes, and it's about breaking down those silos, right? It's not like your department versus my department versus, no, all of our kids are gen ed kids first all yeah. of our students. Um, and so we need to break down those silos and really have collaboration so that we're not having these fragmented, unrelated <laughs> schedules mm -hmm. uh, for our students so that everything feels cohesive and <laughs> collaborative. Yes. Well, great. Thank you. Great job, ladies. Uh, wonderful webinar. Great responses in the chat. Um, it was, as some, as some of our attendees said, this was just what I needed. And the concrete examples were extremely helpful. So we're very grateful to you for coming and sharing your expertise. And Bryce says, thank you for the ideas today. Uh, and thank you to all of our attendees for, for joining us. Um, and hopefully you will join us once again next week. And, you know, Jody and Carly, they are happy to in, engage with you on Twitter. And they'll be back on our webinar series before long. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and everybody have a great day. This is where you can find Saddle back on social media. And we just once again wanted to express our thanks to both the attendees and to the presenters today. And we will see everybody next week. Thank you so much. We love it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everybody. Take care.